Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are considering an allegiance to God's Word by studying Genesis chapters 1 through 11. In this session, we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the cornerstone of the Bible. As we go through these uh, sessions, these 10 sessions on an allegiance to God's Word, we will be reading the entire text of Genesis chapters 1 to 11. So these sessions may be a little longer than, than uh, usual, as well as reading uh, some other larger supporting passages as we consider uh, these chapters. Let's, uh, let's begin. We're looking at the cornerstone of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Let me tell you, to begin with, these two verses are crucial to a right view of Scripture. A foundational allegiance to God's Word as absolute. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 17 and verse 22. I want to look at the Apostle Paul as he stood there on Mars Hill and he shared what every person needs to know about God and Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. And then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent." because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordered, ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. An authority will rule each of our lives, either God's revealed truth or man's human reasoning. Listen, if God created all things, then he controls all things, and he can do all things. Therefore, believing and understanding Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, is crucial. Verse 1 rejects all religious views except Christianity. That means atheism. You see, God created the universe, it tells us. Pantheism, that the idea that uh, 
it, this one universe where we're all part of it. God transcends all that he created. We are part of a created order. Polytheism. There's more than one God. No. One God created all things. Not many gods. Materialism. All matter had a beginning. Dualism. No, God was alone when he created. Humanism. No, it's, it, these two verses let us know that God, not man, is the ultimate reality. And then evolutionism. Listen, God created all things. And then we can, you can just go on and on and on. Consider each of the words in that first verse, just that first verse, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The word God, well, the Hebrew word is Elohim, which is a uniplural noun, like the Trinity. It's a one, but it's plural. Elohim is a plural, but God is one. The word is created there. Listen, only God can create from nothing. Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Also, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The word heavens, it refers to the universe as a whole. Earth refers to the matter in the universe. In the beginning, establishes that time had a starting point. What is the date of creation? Well, study of the internal biblical evidence places it at about 4004 BC, about 6,000 years ago. Then there's the gap theory. The gap theory is an attempt to marry scripture and scientific theory, placing billions of years between verses one and two. <clears throat> well, how is it explained? Well, that a great cataclysm ended the geologic ages and left earth in darkness and covered with water. And why? Well, it was the divine judgment of Satan's rebellion by a flood. And then God recreated the world in six days as it's recorded in the Genesis account. This theory, this gap theory, was developed by Thomas Chalmers and was widely spread by the Schofield Bible. Sadly, many fundamentalists have accepted this theory of origins. Those who claim to hold closest to God's revelation by faith have been so willing to take a baseless theory to stay in step with man's science. It is simply human understanding in judgment of scripture. Evolution requires a lot of time, billions of years, and it depends on the current fossil record. But there's two major problems. First of all, a great flood cataclysm, referred to as the Luciferian deluge in this theory, would have stirred up and destroyed the fossil record that was needed to prove an old age. And then second, the dying out of a species between verses 1 and 2 places death and struggle in God's creation before Adam, which is a contradiction to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, which reads Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus Death spread to all men because all sinned. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21, 22, for since by man came death, by man 
also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so even in Christ all shall be made alive. Death of any kind of creatures is clearly rejected. The gap theory is specifically rejected by scripture. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, the first part of it. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. No gap is possible between verses one and two. Verse two begins with the conjunction and in literal versions of the Bible, like the King James Version. Now there is an obscure use of the word for was that equals became, but no translation, no translation uses this. It's only those that want to talk about a gap theory. It is was without form and void rather than became without form and void, which is what the which is the chaos of the gap theory. It was without form and void, not became without form and void. And it, the biblical argument is simply that God would never create chaos. The biblical response, initial creation was of basic elements to be completed as a system by the end of six days. A literal reading of scripture is not hard, but it requires faith. And darkness was on the face of the deep. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse seven. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do these things. Second Peter chapter three and verse five. For this they willingly forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water in the water. God created the three elements of space, time, and matter, and then he completed the work. And the triune God was present. The Holy Spirit, again, look at um, Genesis chapter one, verse two, the second part of it. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we have the Holy Spirit present. We also have the Son present. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, he is the, invis the, he is the image, referring to Jesus, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things consist. So the spirit was present at creation. The Son was present because he was doing the creating and the Father was present. Genesis chapter one, later on in chapter one, verse 26, the first part of it. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. How important is this plain, literal reading of the text? Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. It is, foundation, it, it is foundational to determining the real, real authority for life and living. Listen, evolution, even a gap theory, allows you to decide what is right and wrong. It elevates human reasoning. The, the peculiar thought process of evolutionary of evolutionary theory is best summarized as follows. In, in kindergarten, we are taught that a frog turning into a prince 
is a fairy tale. When we get to college, we're taught that a frog turning into a prince is science. And yet Darwin himself stated, I am quite conscious that my speculations run beyond the bounds of true science. He himself knew that what he, his ideas, his theories, his evolutionary theory was, was not science. He knew. And then creation with the young earth forces you to accept God's absolute standards. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then Hebrews chapter four, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. If God created all things, then he also controls all things and he can do all things. He is the owner of all, the provider of all, the source of strength, the revealer of truth, the ruler of creation and the judge of everyone. God is the absolute authority who makes up all the rules. The question is, are you in line with God's truth, the Bible? Second Peter chapter one, verse three, tells us that his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life, what, what's life? Well, it's salvation. We all come the same way. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. So we all sin. We all deserve to be punished for our sin, but God loves us. He loves us. And he demonstrated that love by sending his son. For the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. He sent Jesus because of that love, because of our sin. And he demonstrated that on the cross of Calvary. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for us to confess all our sin. He didn't wait for us to get cleaned up of our sin and its effect. No, he sent Jesus to the cross while we were sinners and he died for us to pay the penalty that we deserve. And we need to, with conviction that he died for us and that he rose from the dead, confess that belief. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in, it in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made and with the heart we believe unto righteousness. And then all we need to do with that conviction, that belief, is reach out and ask him to forgive us. Romans 10, 13. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So life is talking about salvation, that we need to be saved. Everything we need to know is available for us to be saved. And godliness, he says, and that's spiritual growth. Because see, he goes on in that passage um, to say in Second Peter, Chapter 1, verses 2 through 10, 
It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you and in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly love, and to brotherly love, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even the blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Amen. You have a great day.